Thank you very much, uh, Omid George. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. And it's an honor to be here speaking with such great local speakers that we heard to this morning. And also my friend Thomas as well speaking here. Th Theo is here as well, Tobias and Farhad as well from some of your excellent uh, German speakers. Um, when Omid, you asked me to speak here, I think it was earlier in 2018, I immediately said yes. I uh, follow you as well and you're a friend of mine and it's an honor to be here. And when I first was going to come, I thought, okay, I've never been to Cologne, so I get a chance to visit Cologne as well. But, of course, when you plan a year ahead, you don't realize your schedule is so bad when you're coming, and it's a short trip for me. But more importantly, it's about relationships, and it's about uh, great working with great people and having great friendships like yourself. So thank you very much. Now, my topic is, uh, is on paradigm shift in carotid and glaucoma surgery, and I will focus uh, on a theme that uh, I call interventional glaucoma. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey. I'm going to apologize because I will speak a little bit about philosophy, which happens, of course, as you get a bit older. Uh, these are my disclosures, and I list them here, of course, uh, because they're important to disclose potential conflict of interest. As well, just to show you, there's a lot of things happening, of course, in the industry world of medicine and ophthalmology and particularly in glaucoma. You know, many years ago, glaucoma was really uh, a very little interest, and now there's been over uh, multiple millions of uh, billions of dollars invested in glaucoma therapeutics, surgical therapeutics, which is very different than what we've seen. I also realize that when we talk about glaucoma, sometimes it brings out the coma <laughs> in everybody. I'm not sure, how do you say coma in German? Coma, coma. okay. So this was actually a meeting I was at. I was speaking, I was over here at the front of the hall and I was looking at the audience and I saw the audience was very bored. I saw that we have this person is not happy, snickering, this person's half asleep, uh, this person is kind of just, uh, you know, no, no expression, this person's mad, this person's on their phone, but the best picture was this person over here, right? <laughs> I will warn you, if anybody in the audience Looks like this, I'm taking a picture of you, that's why I have my phone with me, okay? <laughs> now, just to get everybody's juices going, you know, I, I, I am an a, a anti-segment cataract and glaucoma surgeon, and it's exactly these kind of cases why I went into the field I went into. This is a patient with traumatic glaucoma, pressure of 50, with a dislocated cataract, and an atonic pupil. There's the lens where it's positioned. Now, of course, there's many ways to handle this lens, and I'm not going to show the entire case here, and I'll just forward it a bit, but I wanna, what I wanted to really share with you is the ability now to think about these cases from a vitreoretinal, from a lenticular, from an iris perspective, and from a glaucoma perspective. We're going to do a bit of posterior levitation. We're going to lift the lens up, grab it with a pair of micro forceps, and continue with a curvilinear capsular rexus. Thomas, I didn't think this was a good case for femto, I was debating, but, uh, but I thought I would use my hands here. And this is basically using a couple of micro forceps to propagate the rexus, using vector forces and the mechanics of physics around the eye, which we have to really be considerate of as ophthalmic surgeons, placing iris hooks to support the bag. Now we have what I hope is a perfect 5.5 millimeter rexus. Yes, we want to get that perfect rexus. And then using devices like the capsular tension segment, which we use in these cases of very bad zonular disease, to place the segment into the capsular bag, as you see it slides in, with the iris hook to support the bag. Now we have the bag supported. Another segment here will also uh, place the capsular tension ring. And now the bag is on lockdown. Now, any one of you, I can take you now and start the FACO, and you should be able to do a good FACO in the bag. So the FACO is done, that's no problem, that's, part, that's the easy part. And then we will proceed to pass our Gore-Tex sutures through the eye with the capture tension segments, secured it in place, and put an eye wall in the bag all through small incisions. And we feel very good about ourselves after we do this part. But I forgot, oh yeah, this patient also has an atonic pupil. So you know what, let's also take care of the functional and cosmetic problem in this patient and we will do a pupillary cerclage with tenoproline around the pupil margin to secure the pupil. And don't forget the patient has pressure of 50. Well, we're gonna also place an almond valve. This patient had very bad angle trauma. And so 
This is what I would call, I don't, I don't think it's a triple procedure. It's not a quadruple procedure. Maybe it's five things we did in this case, including the vitrectomy. So I just put this case here because I really wanted to just share with you that, you know, we, we transgress our traditional barriers and our borders of front of the eye, back of the eye, side of the eye, middle of the eye when we do these kind of cases. Okay, so now I have your attention a little bit, right? A video always helps. So what I want to talk about a little bit about is what I want to talk about is innovation, talk about paradigm shift, and Omid gave me this topic, so allow me to give a little bit of philosophy about what I think we need to be thinking about. So I always like to talk, and I, whenever, I, whenever I present, I always think I'm speaking to my students and residents, because that's, for me, a very comfortable place. Otherwise, I see a bunch of intimidating faces looking at me, and I'm a little bit uh, intimidated. But I always talk about the journey. Everybody came to this meeting for a reason. Everyone came from somewhere. Everyone's going from somewhere. And we have a purpose why we're here. We have a purpose in life. And for some of us, the journey is about how do we change things. And in the glaucoma world, we've seen an evolutionary change, but we're seeing a revolutionary change happening very soon, or already happening. And we're still in the middle of this. But the word paradigm shift, if you Google paradigm shift, you will see about 80 million hits, depending on what you, what you type in there. Does anybody know where the term paradigm shift came from? This is one of the most commonly used words out there. Well, it came from a very brilliant physicist and philosopher named Thomas Kuhn, an American physicist. How many have heard of this book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions? Has anybody heard of this book? Even forget about reading it. This book is probably the most important book of the 20th century. It really is. It's one of the most cited academic periodicals ever cited in the history of the academic world. But most of us haven't heard of it. We've certainly heard of paradigm shifts. But Thomas Kuhn's model in talking about paradigm shifts is very interesting. Let me just take a couple of minutes to explain what I mean by this. Now, before Thomas Kuhn's ideas about scientific innovation, many people had subscribed to what's called the Whig theory of discoveries, a typical scientific method, where basically it's like puzzle solving, where through a linear accumulation of knowledge and experimental thinking, we advance knowledge. We test against the status quo to prove hypotheses wrong, and that's how we advance the science. And this is basically how, essentially, the world thought of scientific innovation and the scientific method of development. It was the, basically a march to the, the truth is known. We need to march toward that truth. But Thomas Kuhn didn't think of science this way. He thought of it as a very disruptive, discontinuous method. He challenged the conventional thinkers of the time, Karl Popper and other very important uh, scientific uh, philosophy, philosophists and physicists as well, and challenged and said basically that this is not a natural evolution. This science changes occur because of discrete, discontinuous events, paradigm shifts that occur, very revolutionary, uh, uh, or very revolutionary steps. And he also argued that when change happens, they, are, they, are, they cannot be compared. They're incommensurable. Applying Newtonian physics with planetary motion cannot be compared to quantum mechanics and physics at the subatomic level. They're completely different concepts. You cannot compare them. But there are significant differences, of course, and significant major changes. Now, the, the, the theories of the day at the time of Kuhn's work basically talked about normal science. Scientific scientists practice normal science. This is the scientific method, as I said, of normal linear accumulation of knowledge, adding, supporting evidence one on top of the other. And as we do this, we realize that, that sometimes the model we have for whatever paradigm doesn't really quite fit, and we start drifting from that model. And then the model becomes so problematic, we have a crisis, and then we have a revolutionary. And this is what Thomas Kuhn studied when he looked at Copernicus, looked at Galileo, Aristotle, Newton, uh, Einstein's work, and really challenged that basically science progresses not by evolution, but by revolution. And that's basically what, what, what the paradigm shift was. And probably the most controversial thing that Thomas Kuhn said was that actually innovation occurs because of the humanism of innovation. 
This was a very radical idea. The idea that the human factors involved, the human spirit, the irrational human behavior of emotion, of sociology, of enthusiasm, was very contradictory to the nobility of the scientific process. It was very controversial. But in fact, today we see that scientific innovation is driven by human spirit, and innovation drives humanity. And I think that's the important message I hope we all consider. Because we're all here to learn. We're all looking at data, we're looking at studies, we're looking at videos. And this established our base knowledge. But I would submit that if we really want to make a change, we need to think about where we are in our journey. You know, why we're here, what we see around us, where we want to be, and be in touch with that. And we need to arm ourselves with this approach in terms of making our journey count. Again, it's about asking questions that others don't ask. It's about seeing the unseen. Uh, it's about understanding other perspectives and keeping an open mind and going forward. And it's certainly being different as well. And I, I want to address particularly those that may be earlier in their careers because this is often a challenge, especially as we are approaching things differently and even looking differently. You know, I think it's okay to look different. I know in today's world, uh, in 2018, with a lot of things happening in the world, people are very protective, people are fearful of people who look different or think differently. I understand the fear of that because, of course, it's a bit of a threat, perhaps, in some ways. But the reality is the world progresses when we have differences and we bring those differences together and we learn from each other. And I think that, maybe not science, but that's the real world. So let's talk about the current paradigm, because I'm here to talk not about philosophy, really, because I'm not a philosopher, I'm truly a surgeon. Uh, this is where I'm most comfortable in the operating room. But what is our current paradigm? Our current paradigm is we treat glaucoma in a very medication-heavy world, right? We basically treat most of our glaucoma with medications, and the surgical space of glaucoma is very small. And in fact, if you look at the global market share, if you want to call it, of surgery, Cataract, refractive retina is very big, but you see glaucoma is a very small part of that pie. And that's changing, but the reason that we have this position is because the perception for most of us who see patients is that glaucoma surgery is wrought with complications, difficult recovery for patients. It's not a procedure that we'd want to do. It's not an efficient procedure. We're in and out of the OR quickly and we have to basically then deal with patients after surgery. And of course, this has led to a very medication heavy, which certainly have had a big role in glaucoma and laser trabeculoplasty, sure, but a very big gap that exists between our typical medical therapies and our surgical armamentarium, which of course can be very powerful, but have the very known early and late complications and long recovery. And when I was a resident in... Um, in Toronto, and I was interested in my subspecialty, and I saw the big sexiness of LASIK and cataract surgery was very popular, and everyone was going in that field and said, why don't you go into that field? And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't happy with that approach, Not, no disrespect. I mean, I do LASIK, I do cataract surgery, but I really was interested in glaucoma, and I challenged my professors, and I said, well, why do we treat glaucoma this way? And the answer that I got typically was, this is the way it's been done from 1960. And I think one of the most dangerous phrases, I tell my residents the same thing, fellows the same thing, is we always done it this way, this is why we do it. And I, we should never accept this phrase. And I want to say that I think glaucoma is changing, it's evolving, and we're undergoing a revolution. And why are we undergoing a change? Because you know what? Our current situation, forgive the term, sucks. It sucks because you know what? Too many, too many people go blind still. And too many people are blind by the time they die who have glaucoma. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. We have to do better. And certainly our current treatment paradigm doesn't do well. These are people who are under surveillance of an ophthalmologist. This isn't folks that are not diagnosed and seen very late. We see that the question is not whether someone progresses, but it's how fast they progress. That's where we've gotten with glaucoma. And I think the variability, of course, is well, well known and accepted. We see studies that show despite treating pressures of less than 20, we still see people progress, alarmingly high levels of progression, particularly in high pressure glaucoma. Now, normal pressure glaucoma is a bit of a different story. I'm going to focus more on high pressure glaucoma, but you see that the rates are still, still too high, even in the short term. 
And the uh, early manifest glaucoma treatment study was, I think, a very important study. And the headline was, treatment is good. Treatment helps to reduce progression. But for me, the headline was, treatment still sucks. Because 60% of patients still progressed after many, many years, despite an average pressure reduction of 25%. That, to me, was the headline of the study, that we don't do well with therapy. And remember, these are not people with advanced glaucoma. These are patients with typically early glaucoma. Because we know advanced glaucoma, we know can be, can be pretty bad. This is, the Euro, this is the UK glaucoma treatment study. This was very early glaucoma, randomizing patients to prostaglandin versus placebo. Don't worry, I'm not going to show too many IOP graphs. Don't worry. But you see the pressure difference, and you see the progression rate was less in the treatment group. But I still want to show you that, again, despite even treatment, early glaucoma, we had still, you know, 20% of people progressing, okay, at one year with early glaucoma. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, why are we still seeing progression uh, despite even early therapy? Well, Morton Grant, the great Morton Grant from the 80s, wrote, wrote an editorial many years ago, and recently some colleagues wrote the same thing, and why do people go blind? Well, three reasons. One, it still goes un undiagnosed. Two, we undertreat it. And three, compliance adherence remain a problem. So we have to address these issues, uh, at least with our current therapies. And of course, um, we have a lot of different options that are available to us. Um, I think I need to go maybe some help with, the, with my slides here. Um, let me move forward here. Okay, so whenever we have a space where there are unmet need, we have an opportunity to innovate. And this is the market philosophy of innovation and the creation of a new space that we hopefully see developing in this area. And this is, I think, we're upon the air of interventional glaucoma. Okay, how many have heard of IG? You have, right? Because all of you do Instagram, right? No? Even in Germany? No? No? Really? Not in this age. Not in this age. Only the children. Only the children. I, guess I, I guess I'm very immature. <laughs> but that's fine. For you then, I just interventional glaucoma. Okay? Now, what does interventional glaucoma mean? Interventional glaucoma is not specifically a technology, but it is a computer acting up. It is an attitude, okay, that's addressing what I think is the most important part of our glaucoma therapy, which is quality of life. Not just the quality of life from the disease, but addressing treatment-related quality of life issues. And by doing this, hopefully, we can improve quality of life and also develop cost-effectiveness therapies. And what I mean by this is being very proactive. We talked about gla glaucoma being a terrible disease, still the most, one of the most commonly cause of blindness in the world. It still is, despite all the therapies we have. But it's about being proactive in disease, taking a step earlier than we typically do, and not waiting till we have to progress to surgery, using interventions and diagnostics. And I'll tell you, you'll see uh, some, some work at the American Glaucoma Society meeting in the new year on drug delivery. Drug delivery is very interesting. It's not just what you think it is, replacing topical drops. With drug delivery, we're going to see some very powerful effects in the eye that may surprise you. So you'll see some of the stuff coming in the news uh, in March that I'll be presenting. But this is part of interventional therapies. It's also, of course, MIGS. It's also surgical approaches. Um, and it's also combining drug delivery with, with surgery. And what I hope this is, combined, this is looking at now is basically the concept of addressing the challenges we have. By addressing adherence, by treating earlier, and by being more aggressive in therapy, hopefully addressing this. This changes us from a very passive way to treat glaucoma to a very active way. It's catching up glaucoma to where ophthalmology is going, of course, with other, other specialties. Because we know lowering pressure reduces the progression risk, right? Anywhere from 10 to 20% risk reduction per millimeter mercury reduction has been shown in most studies out there. So we know that, that this is at least current therapies uh, based on pressure reduction can reduce the risk of, of, glau of glaucoma progression. My phone doesn't want to connect to my laptop anymore. Um, we know that lower is better. This is the Canadian glaucoma study 
where the findings show that patients that were kept less than 15 with early glaucoma, I'm going to say again, early glaucoma, they did better over time than patients with higher pressures. And of course, we know in the advanced glaucoma intervention study, the AGES study, that people who kept pressures in the low teens, around 12, progressed less than patients who were higher. So those are some things to think about. We've also seen in the SIGIS study, randomizing patients to surgery medications, that people who kept pressures around 13 or so, or 14, these patients actually had an opportunity to improve their vision, their visual field. You can see these patients actually ended up with visual field improvement. So many of them did. While patients with higher pressures typically lost vision and lost visual field. And we actually see that surgical patients who have more than moderate disease, you know, 10 decibel loss, also showed actually an improvement. So we think of glaucoma as a disease where we get no improvement. Well, if we lower pressure enough, particularly with surgery in patients who have more than mild disease, we actually can see patients may actually improve their visual field. I think that's exciting. And that's why, I, that's why my mantra has been that I think we need to think about being lower. Whether whatever number it is, I don't think that 21 or 18 is acceptable anymore. I think we need to be going a lot lower. So the point of this first part of what I'm saying is that when we treat glaucoma and pressure at least, we need to think about being lower, doing it earlier, and doing it safer. And by doing that, hopefully we'll address the, the issues we have right now with our current paradigm. And the point of treating earlier is, of course, we address the disease earlier, it means that the progression to disability is pushed back over many years if we can. And that's the reason why early intervention, interventional glaucoma, I think makes so much sense. And again, uh, this is, of course, uh, an idea that makes some sense, but we, of course, maybe have been lacking some of, the some of this technology in this area. Now, if we relate to diabetes and hypertension, we know that aggressive therapy can halt disease, if not reverse disease, in the end organs. And particularly with diabetes, the problem was, of course, with insulin injections that patients became hypoglycemic. And that created complications. But we know now with continuous blood sugar monitoring and infusion pumps, we see better disease control. Does this remind you of something? Yes, it reminds you of IOP. Hypotony, continuous monitoring of IOP, and keeping pressures at a low normal range. And I think that's a lesson we need to think about with all this. Now before we start treating everybody, let's remember I'm talking not about fake glaucoma, but about real glaucoma. Patients who have real disease, and particularly worry about the younger patient meaning under 70 years old, that, that bar moves up as you get older a bit, uh, who have more than mild disease with high pressure glaucoma. That's the one that we worry about over the next 10 years, they're gonna have disease. And if you think about it, remember, glaucoma is only young once. So I have to put a cute picture up just, you know, for people who like animals, right? Uh, glaucoma is only young once, right? You know, and that's an opportunity to address it. And intervening early means looking at the opportunities when we go to cataract surgery, addressing adherence, thinking about where our target pressure should be, and particularly in high-risk patients, we need to look at these patients with more uh, closeness and more aggression. And although our current therapies are stepwise, right? We set modest targets and then we lower pressure a bit. We go lower as we need to. We watch patients over time. And progression analysis is not easy to assess. I think the time has come where we need to be aggressive from the beginning. Get these patients lower earlier, and if it means surgery, it means surgery. And I know this is obviously very controversial, but that's the paradigm shift I think that we need to see. And part of the problem is, what do we measure? We're measuring IOP, it's so random. First of all, we measure it incorrectly with Goldman. Secondly, we measure it for one second or two seconds on the eye. Who knows what's happening all the other times of the day? And then we set target pressure based on one random reading. And we underappreciate glaucoma. Patients lose visual field even before that, they lose contrast sensitivity. We don't even care about that. We care about patients not losing fixation. I mean, that's a very defeatist attitude in glaucoma. It's like cataract. Let's wait till they get count fingers, then we do cataract surgery. 
Now we do cataract surgery when the patient has some contrast loss with a small PSC cataract. Examples now when we get an idea looking at IOP fluctuation. You know, we do a lot of home tonometry and IOP monitoring. We see all kinds of pressure changes happening in patients. We do surgery and we see this change. I think one of the problems we face in glaucoma is this procrastination mantra. What I mean by that is these are, the, these are the five stages of procrastination, right? First of all, we have a false sense of security. Oh, people don't go blind from glaucoma. It's 2018. We have lots of medications. We'll be fine. And then we follow a patient, and we follow them, and we have maybe some changes in the visual field, but you know what? Maybe it's just some fluctuation. Let's just bring them back again, reassure us, take another bottle of drop. We get a bit lazy, right? And then we make excuses. Oh, that's not really progression. Maybe they had a bad day. Or you know what, you know, the IOP may be just because uh, of some randomness. And then we deny it, right? We're not sure if there's actually change. And then we have a crisis because the patient now has severe damage and now we're like have to go to surgery. And, and that's a very defeatist attitude. It's an attitude we, we have when we're not confident, right? When we're not sure about things, this is exactly what we do. This is what I do, for example, when my wife says, it's your turn to make dinner, right? Exactly what I do and I end up having a crisis. It's called pizza pizza or something, right? Now, let me ask you a question. When you, have, when you have people who have high pressure glaucoma, do you treat the patient? Patient has a pressure of 25 with an optic nerve damage with a visual field defect. Does anyone watch that patient for five years and watch if they progress or not? Anyone watch? No, because you know what? They're going to progress. They're going to progress. You know they're going to progress, so treat them. Why are you not treating them? But you know what? You, uh, you apply the same philosophy in under-treating glaucoma. Do you get my message? The same progression happens when you treat them, uh, you under-treat them. So if you're going to watch a patient and not treat them because whatever reason, you're applying the same logic for patients that you're treating but not treating them well enough. So we need to change this. You don't watch people lose vision when they're not treated. Don't watch people lose vision when they're under-treated because you know what's going to happen. So Ike is saying we need to lower our targets. Does it mean more medications? Well. We know that adding three or four drops, you know what, it doesn't provide a big meaningful drop in pressure. Once you get a couple of molecules in the eye, adding three or four other molecules, it maybe treats you but not the patient very much, clinically meaningful. And we know that IP fluctuation and peak pressures are always better controlled with surgery than with medication because of the peak and trough and of course for adherence issues. And I talked about, I talked about IP fluctuation, look at the difference between Medicated versus surgical treated pressures in orange in the right eye, we see much better stability of peak pressures and dental fluctuation, which we believe is a risk. And no matter what, compliance remains a major problem. We have to admit this and understand the role of our new therapies as not surgical replacements, but medication replacements. And we all know we see our patients who have trouble with drops, right? This is called the marination technique. Red eyes, conjunctival ocular surface issues, right? These are terrible for eyes, right? That's just making dinner tonight with marination technique. I don't know what that is. And we know that patients who don't take their medications, what happens? They progress, and we have good data on that. When they progress and the disease is worse, it costs the system more money. I think earlier you were talking about cost, right? Oh, co what the cost, what the reimbursement is. This device costs too much money. Well, yes, it costs money now, but what about the patient who's not treated well over time and they cost the healthcare system even more money to take care of them? So cost effectiveness is not just cost of the device, it's cost of the taking care of the patient in their lifetime. And we know, of course, that medications have an influence on surgery and effect on conjunctiva. So medications have a role but they certainly have an issue. So going back to the paradigm shift, normal science of glaucoma therapy, we're seeing that, you know what, our current glaucoma model is not working well, we have a bit of a crisis, so are we ready for a paradigm shift in glaucoma? Right? That's the question. And I've always felt from, a, from my first day in residency, is it elevated pressure is a surgical problem, it's an interventional problem, it's a plumbing problem. Let's deal with it. Now, truly, of course, innovation in glaucoma is neuroprotection and regenerative medicine. That's coming, of course, and we cannot deny that. And actually, as much as I'm a surgeon, my goal is to never do surgery for glaucoma in the future. 
because we will have therapies that will address it at the cellular level, yes. But right now, I believe elevated pressure is an interventional problem. What I mean by this is evolving surgery earlier and primarily for glaucoma. It means when we're going to the eye for cataract, for example, take the opportunity to treat the glaucoma because we're already there. And it means that we need to think about surgery in a different light. Because surgery has a lot of advantage. A lot of advantage, we, talk, we know this as well. Lower pressures, better adherence, better dernal fluctuation control, less peak pressures, uh, perfusion better, quality of life can be better as well. But what do we do right now? Most surgeons operate very late. Most locoma specialists operate late. And when we operate late, meaning the disease is already so bad, we get more complications, we then get a little bit shy, we don't want to do surgeries for the next patient. It's a bad cycle to be in. We have to break this cycle. We have to break this cycle if we're going to move forward in glaucoma therapeutics. It means, again, rather than being reactive, it means being proactive. And as ophthalmologists, we're very familiar with this. You know, I'm a big evidence-based guy. I love evidence. I love publishing. This is what I enjoy uh, almost as much as surgery. The Cochrane Review showed that, in fact, surgical intervention is preferred over medical intervention for patients with advanced glaucoma. In fact, the NICE paper, uh, the NICE guidelines, actually talk about patients with advanced glaucoma going to surgery first. How many people here with a patient who has a minus 12 decibel loss would tell the patient they need surgery first line? Most of you would not do that, despite the evidence. So you're going against the evidence, against the Cochrane Review, against the NICE report, and SIGITS, which is based, again, on a randomized study comparing surgery versus medications in patients firstly diagnosed with glaucoma. So patients who have more than moderate disease did better with surgery. And this is not MIG surgery, by the way. This is trabeculectomy. This is mitomycin hardcore trabeculectomy. So imagine if we have a better surgery, potentially, how even better, perhaps, the results may be. So what will it take for us to go to surgery earlier? I have to stand over here. My phone doesn't reach that far, I think. Well, I think we know from cataract world that invasiveness matters, right? You know, there was a day where extra cap was the norm and people were resistant to go to FACO and, hey, my results are just as good with extra cap as it was with FACO or PRK or LASIK, whatever else example you have. We know, that, we know the revolution that FACO provided. We now do FACO on a very mild cataract when before we would wait till the cataract got... Uh, got uh, ripe, so to speak. So the answer, of course, is safety, right? Safety is what we need to establish in glaucoma. And we see with new procedures in the US, certainly, the uptick of some of the new procedures, significantly increasing and even taking over the market compared to other surgeries in glaucoma. I think as we have safer glaucoma surgery, we also feel, I think, more comfortable aiming lower because we feel we can now do something with our hands to get there. And as I said before, interventional glaucoma is this philosophy of intervening early and not waiting, being confident, not procrastinating, using technology as an advantage here, not as a disadvantage, and again, proactive versus reactive. And that's really the rationale of why MIGS came upon us. And I will say MIGS is not the end all, MIGS is not the final solution. But it made us think differently, which I think was the best thing MIGS did, would made us think differently about glaucoma. Because the next innovation is going to get there. And that's why I said a few years ago at, at ASCR at Bing Course, I said, MIGS is an idea whose time has come. It's an idea. The technology, yeah, you can argue whether one works or not, but the philosophy of MIGS and interventional glaucoma is already here, which to me is the biggest value of what we did. And this is, these are some of the things we talk about with MIGS. This is a very different approach in glaucoma, predicated on safety. Safety, safety, safety. Uh, and using, again, a very minimally invasive approaches. And we can, think, we can think of MIGS as, you know, procedures that basically provide conventional outflow. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, suprachoroidal outflow procedures, but this was kind of MIGS. But we also cannot forget that we still have subconjunctival procedures that still have an important role for some patients. And I call that subconjunctival MIGS. And we see a lot of devices that have come upon us. A lot of these devices actually were developed with the assistance of engineers and scientists from the cardiovascular world. I've had a chance to work closely with 
uh, with engineers and, and scientists and, and others who, uh, who think of this as a very much similar problem that we see, for example, in other parts of the body with stenting approaches, subconjunctival, Sems canal, and otherwise as well. But we must remember that just like in a paradigm shift, don't compare one technology to another older technology because they're not comparable. Just like you cannot compare Einstein's philosophy and quantum physics with Newtonian physics. They're both important, but they're different levels of thinking. And that's important. With glaucoma surgery, we think of it now not only as a surgical intervention, but something that we have as an alternative to medications. The competition is not just with surgery, it's with medications. And based on pressure targets, we can then choose the weapon of choice, including FACO. And this is where MIGS and interventional glaucoma, I think, play a role in the entire spectrum of the glaucoma patient, from early to late, uh, and, and mild to severe. That's the gap we're filling. Now, when we think about choosing a glaucoma procedure, or any procedure, we think of a lot of attributes. And of course, we think about IOP lowering and safety, but we think about visual recovery, ease of use, reimbursement and cost are big issues as well, how much we have to manage the patient postoperatively. Those are big turnoffs with trabeculectomy, I know that. And I know we have to change this thinking if we're going to have everybody doing uh, these, this, this work. And we think of the context of glaucoma and cataract. If we combine something with cataract, we have to absolutely have great safety. We cannot impact the visual recovery from a cataract procedure when the patient's going for cataract surgery, primarily because that's a great procedure. We don't want to interfere with that. When we're doing glaucoma surgery alone, of course, it's a different story a bit. We have to, of course, we're going in particularly for the glaucoma. We have to make sure we, have, we address efficacy. Now, everybody here who does cataract surgery, you are glaucoma surgeons, of course, because we know FACA lowers pressure. It lowers it modestly, right? About, you know, 16%, about over three years. So it's a small reduction, but it does lower pressure. Probably some of the best data we have here. And we know many of our patients, 10 to 20% of patients who go to cataract surgery have glaucoma. So it's an opportunity here, a one-time opportunity. You know, I'm going to wake everybody up who has the coma. Anyone have coma yet? This patient's going to cataract surgery with about three diopters of width of a cylinder. How many would not think about a toric lens here? Of course you, you would think about it. No, you wouldn't think about it? Leave them? Oh, you would think, okay, good. Yes, George, thank you. You're supposed to help me, not, not go against me here. Yes, of course. Um, we would think about putting a toric lens in this patient, right? I mean, it makes sense. This patient has um, a high most. We may not use it, maybe because of cost or other, but at least we think about it. Well, what I like to say is MIGS is to FACO like toric lenses are to IOLs. That's my philosophy. And I know that we have talked a lot about refractive cataract surgery, which I think is amazing, the merger of refractive and cataract surgery. Well, I think we certainly know and we certainly see the merger of glaucoma and cataract surgery. And I think this is what we are, this is what we are witnessing here. This is, what we, this is what we see. And I think MIGs have an excellent role for patients who have pressure targets in the mid-teens, who have disease severity that would be controlled at this level. It's a good opportunity to reduce medications or eliminate them, combine them with cataract surgery or even standalone. And most of our mixed procedures now address the proximal dysfunction of trabecular meshwork. That's where the pathology is. Let's get past it. Let's get aqueous into the canal. They do assume, though, however, that the rest of the aqueous outflow system is working, which is an assumption. We would love to have angiography, for example, for the eye, which is coming, to be able to detect disease and, and, and target locations. We know, for example, in the Shems Canal apparatus that there are certain areas of the canal that are high flow. These are called aqueous veins. There's only four or five per eye or so. And these are super highways coming off of the canal compared to a more plexus area where there's more resistance. So placing a device, for example, or working in an area, it's important to find these areas to work in. Now, there's a lot of MIG surgeries that are, that are out there. It's a bit confusing. Then we'll briefly go through them. I don't, I don't have enough time to go through every one of them. 
Well, we have stenting approaches, we have uh, cutting approaches, we have dilation approaches, a lot of options out there. And we can divide them up between stenting, dilation, and cutting. And you can see we have stents approaches, we have dilation with viscoelastic and other approaches, we have cutting approaches, and we have ablation approaches. These are all ways we think about enhancing conventional outflow. Of course, the eye stent is probably one of the more popular devices. It had a bit of a rough start, I think because the devices were not placed very well and the understanding was not very, very good. We now typically place a couple of devices. We target where to put the devices in and we see when we inject tripan blue dye, we see the dye uptake within the aqueous veins nicely to show on the table we have good flow. We have second generation inject models which are more efficient in how they are delivered with a simple push button. Look, I'm putting it right over the aqueous vein where the blood, re blood reflux is. That's where the aqueous vein is. I'm looking for blood reflux. The blood's coming out through the orifice of that device. It means I put it over the vein. I, I hit the oil well, right? You have to drill for oil where the oil is, not where there's no oil. Same thing with aqueous outflow. We have to know where the veins are. Otherwise, the results are not going to be so good. That's why some people have very good results. Some people say it doesn't work. You know what? Depends on the surgical approach. We have other stents that are longer and larger that, uh, that, that, can, uh, that, can, uh, that can apply aqueous outflow over a larger area. We have microcatheters we can use to uh, circum circumdilate the canal. This can also help to relieve obstruction beyond the canal by placing this microcatheter, the eye track, which we use for canaloplasty. This is admin turner canaloplasty. We inject viscoelastic. We can use the same catheter to also cut the canal to break the trabecular meshwork to relieve the obstruction depending on the severity of disease. These are all very elegant ab internal methods without dissecting conjunctiva which can be done again with a very efficient procedure with or without combination with cataract surgery. Okay, so we pass the catheter all the way around and then we may just simply dilate but in this case what I'm going to show you is the GAT procedure, which is, which is basically gonioscopic assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. We're actually using the catheter to actually do a trabeculotomy internally to cut. This is, more, this is the pediatric case actually. And I find this to be a very effective procedure for these patients. It can be also used again as a mixed procedure as well. And once we do this, we basically relieve the obstruction and we have direct access of aqueous, directly to the aqueous vein 360 degrees around, okay? And then we have other cutting approach, like the dual blade, the Cook dual blade, which has two cutting edges to remove a strip. This is actually a goniectomy, not just a goniotomy. And this procedure here, we have, uh, uh, again, an admin turner approach. We cut an inner wall, strip it away, typically about 90 degrees. Most aqueous veins are typically infronasal. And that's the area we like to focus on if we're going to focus on one area only, randomly at least. So the foot plate is placed within the, uh, within the trabecular meshwork into the canal. It's then stripped away and removed. So these give us more options for our patients. These are procedures that actually cataract surgeons, as long as you know how to do gonioscopy, of course, you have the hands to be able to do this in the eye. And the satisfaction of, of treating both diseases can be quite remarkable. But the question still comes, sorry, is, MIGS is too hard to learn. MIGS doesn't work. It doesn't work. Come on. Is, is MIGS really safe? Are you sure? It's too expensive. We cannot afford it. Or it's not available. Access problems. So let's quickly tackle some of these challenges. First of all, to learn MIGS, it means learning gonioscopy. I'll show one picture up. And this is basically my friend Alex Topov from Bulgaria. He's the tallest ophthalmologist in the world. He should have gone into orthopedic surgery. I'm about six foot one. He's probably like about seven feet or something, right? Size nine gloves. And I tell you, if anybody says they cannot do MIGS, listen, Alex can do MIGS. So can you. That's not an excuse. What about the data? Well, MIGS is the most studied glaucoma surgery ever done in the glaucoma history. Okay? Major big studies, comparative studies, randomized studies. No de glaucoma device has ever been studied in this manner. Trabeculectomy, 
Ahmed valve, bare valve tubes, anything else, non peritoneal surgery, has been studied to this extent over so many years. And we see good studies that basically wash out patients, randomize patients to cataract surgery or without a stent. And then look at these patients after two years, 550 patients. And we do see results, that, a difference in pressure lowering. First of all, we see, number one, FACO lowers pressure. We know this. But FACO plus device can give us about 2.3 millimeter difference in pressure reduction. Which when you think, well, what's two millimeters? Is that really worth it? Well, you know what? It is worth it when you think these are averages and also the fact that these pressures, again, are going from 19 to 17 or 19 to 15. But more important than that is the fact we're looking at medications. And we can tell our patients that there's a higher chance of getting off medications when we do the cataract surgery with the procedure. And I think the real world data in the real world has shown uh, improvement in results. What about safety? This is why we do MIGS. You know what? We recently had a MIGS device withdrawn from the market by the FDA. Completely disappeared from the market. Well, wait a minute. Does that, really, does that really mean MIGS is safe? Do we have to question one of our basic philosophies of MIGS? Well, the data showed. After five years, we had more endothelial cell loss when the patient had FACO plus Cypass, which is a supracortal device, compared to FACO alone. That was a significant shock. It was taken off the market. But we also realized that actually it seems to be related to placement. And there was a direct correlation with how far the device was in the eye, touching the cornea, versus placing deeper in the eye. And when the device was placed more into the anterior chamber, these patients are the ones that drove the results. So we're learning that surgical technique plays an important role for efficacy, but also safety. And we also reported that we don't believe this is a widespread mixed problem. Because, for example, the canal devices are placed in the canal, not touching the cornea. We have to get more data on this, of course. But in over, the, over 10, 12 years, for example, with eye stent, we haven't seen these problems. So we believe that MIGS is still a safe procedure. What about the cost? Because cost is always a big issue, right? Well, I talked before about the cost effectiveness of taking care of patients early. And you know what? You can do MIGS with a 27 gauge needle if you wanted to. You could do MIGS with a 5-0 or 6-0 proline by placing it around the canal and opening the canal up if you wanted to. So you can do MIGS with a couple of dollars if you really wanted to. Now, you may have more variable results. You may have some more complications potentially, but you can do that. And I won't get into this detail, but we are publishing, I'm doing a lot of my work now in health economics. I feel I have a degree actually in health economics now because I have to do all this work with the government in Canada to try to help to understand. We're using Markov models and incremental cost utility ratios to show that mixed procedures can be cost effective. Now, as far as efficacy is concerned, and I'm coming toward the end of my presentation, so I want to talk a bit about the traditional approaches, a bleb is still the best way to get low pressure. So we cannot ignore the bleb. We have different ways to create a bleb. We have non penetrating surgery, TRAB, express tubes. They all make blebs differently. But we're now in the era of micro stents and micro shunts. This gives us more control. I call this subconjunctival MIGS because it standardized bleb surgery and creates potentially efficacious and better morphological blebs. These blebs on OCT you can see are fairly diffuse and posteriorly, even with mitomycin. And I think that this is the way of the future with bleb surgery. The Zen gel stent has undergone a lot of different trials. It's an admin turner approach. We used to think it's very simple. Put the needle through the eye, in the subconscious space, put the Zen in and you're done. Well, it wasn't so easy because you know what? The Zen can get stuck in tenons and can result in high needling rates. So we changed our approach. We use pneumatic dissection, air dissection in the conjunctiva to separate conjunctiva and tenons. We place the needle adequately. We see results that can lower pressure to the low teens and medication use significantly similar to trabeculectomy, as our study showed, comparing trabeculectomy and Zen with similar results. But we also found that Zen has less intervention, better recovery, less surgical astigmatism, uh, less visits after surgery with similar pressures. It's still a bleb though, so we don't rush to it, but it is something that has more power. 
in focus, another device which probably will be the most powerful device. It is an ab external approach. It does require some concept of dissection, however. But the blebs in these procedures are very nice and posterior, and the efficacy here is really rivaling, if not better, the trabeculectomy in my hand. So we rarely do trabeculectomy. We rarely do non-penetrating surgery now because these have replaced it for the most part. And they're really beautiful blebs with very low pressures. I'm really amazed at the results we're getting with this. It's not perfect again, but I'm really amazed with the, with the, with the reductions we see um, in both combined as well as standalone. So this is the landscape in glaucoma. We see risk on this side. We see pressure lowering on this side. Medications are bottom left. Traditional surgery bought up right. Where we, where, we, where, we, where we would like to be, preferably, if we had a choice in terms of where we want to be, if this is going to work for me still, I'm almost finished here, hopefully it'll still work, um, is we want to be up in here, right? We want to be up in there. Well, higher than that. Way up there, right? Low risk, high pressure lowering. If we look at where MIGS is, MIGS is basically here, right? It's got good safety, but pressure lowering, you know, we'd like to get more, but we still have good efficacy. And we see then subconjunctival MIGS procedures, again, very similar to trabeculectomy, but with more safety. So MIGS are expanding. We're using MIGS earlier and later in disease. This, again, ties into the interventional glaucoma philosophy, uh, being proactive, right? Lower is better, earlier is better, safer is better. This is my mantra, mantra interventional glaucoma and IG. Being proactive, combined or not. Of course, we have challenges here. We have a lot of criticism. We should. We should get healthiest criticism. But we must build on each of our failures and must build on the criticisms to continue to improve. And interventional glaucoma and MIGS is just starting. Yes, I know glaucoma is not so sexy, but maybe it's becoming more sexy with some of these newer approaches. But it's given us more ideas and, and thoughts. And bringing it back to our patients again and quality of life is where we guide us in terms of innovation. Many of you will, will have to decide where you fit. Are you somebody who's very early in the innovation cycle or late? But I will say, at least in interventional glaucoma, we already are kind of crossing the chasm where we get momentum built up and I think we're seeing this move into the interventional glaucoma space. So I appreciate the opportunity. Omid, thank you so much for inviting me. George, thank you very much. I hope that uh, I've given you something to think about, about innovation, about remembering the journey. And as much as we're about the science and about the surgery, the best thing that we can bring is what we have the most important thing to ourselves, which is our humanity. I think science, we forget about humanity too much. We talk about data, but the real innovators out there didn't look at data, they actually thought about the human side of innovation. I think that's the biggest difference we make. The future is here uh, and present. Uh, Valen, Dank, and Olaf. <laughs> and I'll see you on social media. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there, is there a headphone? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Aik Ahmed. And uh, this was a very, very powerful and uh, also inspirational uh, presentation. We, I think we learned very much um, about what's going on. Um, of course, um, there, there will be uh, time and there will be uh, discussions. But uh, the direction you are, you are showing us uh, seems to be very clear. Are there any questions to uh, Aig Ahmed? Because I have to mention that uh, uh, his taxi is leaving in about 10 minutes. So uh, oh. we, have to, we have 10 minutes time uh, to ask him his questions. And, and thereafter, uh, he has to go. That's sad. Professor Weber. Uh, uh, Hello. Yes. Ike, thank you very much for your enthusiastic presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm dealing with glaucoma for more than 30 years, and uh, you see my, hairs, uh, <laughs> my hair grew white by that. And one of the reasons it grew uh, white was uh, because uh, also in Germany, I'm convinced that uh, we have many uh, undertreated glaucoma cases. And um, I have to confess, uh, and that, that, that's my message, that uh, I myself also had under-treated under patients because of, of 
two errors that I found out during these 30 years. Um, from the beginning, I, the, the one thing is I, I always thought that glaucoma was more or less a little bit linear. And um, I, I tried in perimetry to find out uh, indices and, and ways to, to follow up progression uh, in, in this linearity, find out whether they get, get blind before they die or, or after they die. And uh, they are not linear. And as they get older, it sometimes gets a job. Patients, I, I followed up for 20 years, having always the same pressure, and that's because the, the resistance of their optic nerve and of, uh, of their third neuron gets less. And that's what, what my error was. And uh, I was astonished and had to do, do even surgery in very aged patients. The second error uh, uh, that I learned is I, um, yes, no. Uh, uh, is that I thought with following up uh, perimetry uh, and the optic disc, HRT and all that, uh, would help me to, to see um, whether the pressure was, was doing harm or not. And I found out that between high pressure, I had, uh, uh, between high pressure, uh, the pressure going high and the loss of the visual field, there is a, a gap of three to five years. And in the end, I'm at the beginning where I was before. I do not look that much on perimetry and on the optic disc. I look on the IOP and if it's high, I have to put it down very low, as you said. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for your comments. I do agree that we, we do have to understand that disease, disease progresses variably and that our imaging technologies and our visual fields do fall short for progression analysis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but thank you for the comments. Mike, um, you mentioned that uh, the merging of cataract and glaucoma surgery is uh, right now on the hand and that makes absolutely sense, but on the other side you said that um, interventional glaucoma means early intervention, so far beyond uh, the cataract is uh, on site. Uh, what is your opinion with regard to mix in, uh, in phagic eyes in younger patients, 30 years old, 40 years old? Uh, I mean, that would be the age that you um, mentioned would be uh, time of interaction. Yeah, great question. Now, fortunately, of course, with glaucoma, it's typically a disease of the elderly. And we know the cataract surgery age is reducing. It used to be 20 years ago, we used to do cataract surgery on average patients who are 78. Now, in North America, we do cataract surgery when they're 70. So it is a bit early, but your point is well taken. And I do intervene earlier in those phacic patients, and I think that there is a role for MIGs in these phacic patients um, or going subconjunctivally. So I think I particularly worry about the young patient with glaucoma damage because they have 40 years ahead of them, and I don't believe that medications are going to be enough if they've already got significant damage. So I actually intervene pretty early. Uh, and you choose your weapon of choice, again, depending on the pressure target. Uh, whether it's MIGs, the nice thing with MIGs is we do MIGs and it still keeps the door open for other procedures as well. Uh, so uh, my philosophy is still to intervene early in those patients, whether they're young or old, uh, or cataract or not. So standalone MIGs is still, I think, developing, and I think you make a very good, very good point. I think there's still similar philosophies. <coughs> okay, I have the experience that I want to do surgery, or I tell them go for surgery, but the patient is not willing to do. He says, no, mm -hmm. no, 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 I don't believe. Okay, he is pro pro procrastination or what you said. He's, not, yeah. he's denying, he's not believing. We know that we have to lower the pressure and we know and everything, but the patient is not willing and you heard earlier this day, the Germans have the skeptic gene in their, in their um, biology. So they are very skeptic yeah. and they always believe that the doctor is only wanting to earn money. Even so, I sent him to someone else they, send, uh, they think uh, that the, someone else is giving me money for this. So, even we know all, I think the paradigm uh, shift <coughs> you, you, you were telling us is not, uh, the not the point here in this area. We okay, all know this. We got the point. The yeah, sorry. Well, I, I, th I think we see, the, we see the same problem. And I think it's about, and again, I always have patient empowerment, and, I, and it's a, it's a patient-centric approach. It's funny because in, in, because of all the attention now in social media and everything else, patients actually come and ask for MIGs. So a lot of it is cultural as well. Education makes a big difference. Public education makes a diff difference. It's going to take some time for this. Uh, but the cultural change is often the one that lags the longest. 
rather than the technology change, right? And so it takes a long time. I mean, you know, uh, for example, this is all PC-based computers, right? Right? Now people are changing to Mac. Sorry, no, no offense. Right? You know what I mean? It takes time for changes, right? You know, so, but I, see, I hear your problem, and this is something we are responsible for. Same thing with LASIK, same thing with, same thing with cataract surgery a long time ago. So thank you. So one more question, please. When you are doing surgery, how do you define early glaucoma? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, conventionally, of course, we base it on visual field. The problem is, of course, once you have visual field damage, you already have 40% of your retinal ganglion cell lost. So, for me, I still do base it on visual field, but I know the patient already has significant disease already. So, for me, my definition is still on visual field, but I know in my head, patients already had significant nerve damage. That's, what I, that's, the, way I, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Well, I think... Uh, Thank you, man. Yeah. Man. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. I take your call. I maybe, maybe I, you have, um, you may have the chance to, um, you, you, m you may have the chance, personal wish, you may have the chance to say, shake some hands on your way out <laughs> because my uh, operating staff wants to meet you also. Oh, okay. And okay, I tell you sorry. why, and I tell you why. Always when I get into trouble, I say, do we have this Ahmed segments available oh, okay. in cataract yeah. surgery. So they know this is the guy okay. who, is in, who, who is in the game when it's getting exciting. <laughs> thank you. I should have brought some in my pocket then, yeah. but thank you. I think I'm going to walk, walk yeah. there, okay? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.